The company Blue Origin envisions a future where millions of people are living and working in outer space, and they want to be able to achieve this goal by creating a more cost-effective way to get to orbit or to send people into space. Now, in the previous video of the history of Blue Origin, we discussed the Sharon and Goddard test vehicles that they had developed to see how well they could actually create rockets. And in this video, we're going to continue with the new Shepard project and see what new rocket engines they had to develop, what new tests they were able to do, and what other companies they had worked with. So let's talk about that. Now first off, if you haven't seen the previous episode of the History of Blue Origin, I highly recommend that you go back and check that out, just to get a better understanding of where the company is at this point. But we finished off in the last episode talking about the Goddard test vehicle and its final flight in April of 2007. In fact, if we remember, Goddard was also called Propulsion Module 1 for its New Shepard project. Now New Shepard is named after Alan Shepard Jr., who was the very first American astronaut to get to space. Now Alan Shepard didn't make it into orbit initially, he just went into a suborbital flight, which has to reflect the name New Shepard. Now at the same time when they were doing these tests with Goddard, Blue Origin announced what exactly their plan was with the test vehicle. Now during these initial announcements, Blue Origin said what exactly they wanted to be able to achieve. The very first suborbital launch system needed to be done by 2010 to do various experiments on board the rocket, and then they wanted a crewed component to be done by 2012, therefore they could be sending upwards of 50 50 launches per year with people on board. Again, they're focusing on reusability so they wouldn't have to develop multiple rockets, instead using a few small select in their arsenal. And hence with these new goals, they also said that during their timeline from 2007 up into 2010, they wanted to have around a maximum of 10 test flights that would incrementally improve the altitude that they were able to fly at, as well as the reusability of the rocket and the prototypes they are using, meaning they would need to make stronger engines and bigger rockets to then be able to reach suborbital flight. Now at the time, Blue Origin was still very secretive, so not a lot of people knew exactly what was going on behind the curtain. And in fact, looking back, we know that they were faced up against a lot of challenges. Because of just how weak the BE-1 is compared to many other engines on the market, the first thing they would have to do is improve their capability on the engine side. Either they would have to buy one from another company or create their own. And for Blue Origin, since a lot of it was secretive, they wanted to be able to create their own. Own. So in this sense, they had to make a new rocket engine. So the name of the new rocket engine is Blue Engine 2 or BE2. And if we recall just for a second, BE1 was a monopropellant pressure fed rocket engine, which got around 9.8 kilonewtons of thrust. Now in order to make a stronger rocket and increase the thrust available, they would have to make BE2 a pump fed bipropellant rocket engine. Now what exactly does that mean? Well, bipropellant instead of monopropellant being one propellant, bipropellant means two Two propellants, and in fact, this one uses kerosene or rocket propellant one and hydrogen peroxide. Now, in the last video, we discussed hydrogen peroxide, but what exactly is kerosene and how is this effective in rocket engines? Now kerosene is a hydrocarbon, and that just means that it contains many carbon atoms bonded together with a lot of hydrogens around them. And in fact, kerosene more specifically, or for rocket propellant, they try and aim to have around 12 carbon atoms within the molecule itself, but it can vary from time to time. Now kerosene, or rocket propellant one, is actually fairly common in the aerospace industry. And although there are many different types of rocket propellant out there, kerosene is actually relatively cheap, is less dangerous, and more efficient than a lot of other types. In fact, this rocket fuel is used for many different types of well-known rockets, including the Saturn V, or the rocket that took us to the moon, the Falcon 9, which is what SpaceX uses right now for their reusable launches, as well as the Soyuz, which is our main way to get to the International Space Station right now. Now, if you recall, I also said BE2 is pump-fed, which is actually fairly complicated compared to pressure-fed. I mean, when we have pressure-fed, all we had to do was pressurize the propellant and get it out of the tank. Whereas in this case, we're more of pulling it out of the tank with a turbo pump. And it's fairly complicated, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but a good way to think about it is if you think of a boat turbine going through the water, it's basically pushing and pulling the water to be able to get the boat to move forward. Whereas instead of moving the actual boat, imagine the boat standing still and we're trying to move the water out. In this case, we're not using water, but we're using the two propellants that we have. So by having a separate combustion that spins this turbo pump, then we can pull the different propellants in together into a combustion chamber and therefore meet higher pressures and therefore get better thrust. 
Now, because of all this improvements to the engine, they improved the efficiency from BE1 being 9.8 kilonewtons of thrust to 140 kilonewtons of thrust. This is a major upgrade, not only for the company, but also the rocket they're using because it's just much more efficient and much stronger altogether. Now, they weren't able to develop this rocket engine overnight. In fact, it took a few years for them to be able to do so, and this would eventually only have the purpose of being integrated into Propulsion Module 2, or PM2. Now, there isn't a better name for Propulsion Module 2, unlike Goddard, which had a fun name. This one just has PM2, so we're gonna stick with that. But PM2, there's not a lot of information about it because Blue Origin doesn't necessarily release all their specifications. However, we do know that it had five BE2 engines and was fairly bigger than Propulsion Module 1 or Goddard. Now, Propulsion Module 2 didn't necessarily have a space capsule on top of it, but replaced it with just an aerodynamic dome to replicate the capsule altogether. Now, alongside the development of their new rocket engine and their new propulsion module, they were also developing a space capsule. And most of what we know about this space capsule has to do with their abort launch system. And this is mainly because in 2009, NASA awarded them a $3.7 million contract to be able to improve innovative ways to get off of the launch pad in case of an emergency, as well as test new lightweight and more safe methods of having a space capsule. And at the time, Blue Origin only had around 200 to 250 employees. So for them to be able to work on a new rocket engine, a new propulsion module, and a new space capsule is a lot for them to be able to do. Therefore, they looked to other companies to be able to help them with this. Now, one of the best companies to work on this abort escape system would be a company by the name of Aerojet Rocketdyne because of all the work they had done with both solid and liquid rocket engines throughout their entire history in the aerospace industry. Therefore, Aerojet Rocketdyne worked mainly on the solid rocket motor that would push the space capsule away from a rocket in case of it going wrong or exploding. Whereas Blue Origin mainly focused on the controllability and the thrust direction of that motor. Therefore, if you think about it, Aerojet Rocketdyne made the actual motor and Blue Origin made what controlled the direction of that motor to be able to get away as safe as possible. Now, for those of you that don't know what a solid rocket motor is, it's basically like a firework. Once you launch it and it goes up, there's really no good way to turn it off. Therefore, for this type of abort system, it's pretty effective because all you need is a really short, very big burn right away to be able to get you far enough from the rocket in case it was to explode. So if we recall from their goal, they wanted all of this to be done by 2010, but it, that didn't happen. They, they weren't even close. They didn't get their first test launch of the propulsion module 2 until May of 2011. And in fact, this was just a small hover slash hop test as you see now, and it was just basically testing the system altogether. In fact, in this flight, it only used three of the five BE-2 engines that were on the rocket. Now, the second flight of PM-2 took place a few months later in August of 2007, and they didn't release the video of this, which is rather unfortunate because it was actually a malfunction and they had to destroy the rocket at an altitude of 13.7 kilometers. Now, let's hold on for a second. Their previous tests had only got to around 100 meters, or at least what they had publicized, whereas now they're getting to 13.7 kilometers. That's a pretty big jump. I mean, we just saw this video where it hopped a little bit and came back down. Now they're getting well well, pretty high up there. So this is rather impressive for the company over this short time frame. But it did eventually fail and they had to destroy it. But it was going pretty fast when it failed, Mach 1.2 or 1.2 times the speed of sound. Now if I take a Mach of 1.2 as that was the speed of sound at the altitude that they were at, that means that it was actually going 1380 kilometers per hour, which is really fast for a vehicle that had just previously hopped just a little bit. Now, it is important to know that neither of the tests with Propulsion Module 2 actually had a space capsule on top. They were just a dome, as I mentioned before, and therefore, they're not at the caliber yet to reach that suborbital flight with experiments on board, or crew for that matter. Therefore, they need to make a bigger rocket. But before we get into that, we need to talk about the space capsule as a whole. As you remember, they won a contract from NASA to be able to effectively show that they can make this thing more efficient, lightweight, safer, and have this new way of being able to abort from the launch pad. But let's see what took place on their new test of just the space capsule and its abort system. And in fact, this would take place a little bit over a year after the failure with PM2, which means that we're now getting into the 2012 timeframe.
time or late 2012 for that matter. Now, as you see in the video right now, it quickly aborts off the launch pad. Now imagine being in that rocket when that happens. I mean, it's better than exploding, but it doesn't necessarily seem like a pretty smooth or fun ride. But the test was a success. The parachutes deployed and it landed safely. 497 meters away from the launch pad, reaching a maximum altitude of 703 meters. Now I wanna give a quick shout out to NASA because the only way we would have gotten those numbers was because it was a NASA contract. Blue Origin really didn't announce much of anything about this test other than releasing the video, and Aerojet Rocketdyne actually had their own public release saying that they had helped them with that. So that's one of the main ways that we know all of this happened together, was just because of the collaboration that Blue Origin had with other people. They didn't necessarily release this all on their own. Now, as I mentioned, the propulsion module two wasn't necessarily big enough to get an actual space capsule into suborbital flight, which means that Blue Origin now has to go back to the development stage, design new rockets, design a stronger rocket, and altogether put all the pieces to be able to develop a new suborbital rocket or the very first new Shepard. And that is what we're going to discuss in the next video. So what do you think about Blue Origin so far? How big are their successes? And what do you think they compared to SpaceX at the time? But thank you for watching and I hope to see you in the next one.